Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want to read another translation of the same text, the message interpretation. It reads as such. It says, going a little ahead, he fell on his face praying, My father, if there's any way to get me out of this, but please, not what I want, you do what you want. When he came back to the disciples, he found them sound asleep. He said to Peter, can't you stick it out with me a single hour? Stay alert. Be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without even knowing you are in danger. See, there is a part of you that is eager, ready for anything in God. But there is another part that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. Wow. I want to put a tag on our text this evening and simply entitled it, Clash of the Titans. Clash of the Titans. Let's pray. Father, which are in heaven, I pray that you be with us now. Hide me behind your cross. May I, may I not be seen, but that you be lifted up. And that, Father, that in this battle that's going on inside of us, may you, Lord, have the way, your way, so that we may follow after you. Amen. 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 See, it's safe to say that there are those times in our lives, in the times and the days in our minds, where we wonder, should we go left or should we go right? Do I fight this fight or do I just throw in the towel and give up? In a real sense, we all find ourselves always caught behind a rock and a hard place, looking for a way out. And the truth be told, nine times out of ten, we put ourselves in our own little predicaments and inside of our own holes and locking ourselves behind our own prisons that we built ourselves. You see why? Because inside of us, there are two titans. We are faced with a difficult situation or task. The two titans always clash either to go left or either to go right. Paul spoke of the clash of the titans in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 and 21. He said, for that which I want to do, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Paul right now in the, that text is having his back because he wants to do good, but every time he tries to do good, he always turns around and do wrong. It seems as if we are naturally attracted to sin. Hmm. Let me say this. There's nobody in here that took a class on how to sin. Mm -hmm. There's no classes on how to sin. There's no, there's no sin 101 or sin, sin 450 on how to sin better. We came out the womb sinning. Mm. Born and sin shaped in iniquity. Because that's just what we're naturally attracted to. When you look at the type of movies that we like, when we look at the type of things that, that we enjoy, because we are naturally attracted to sin. And so Paul understands that's who I am. That's what I'm dealing with. And here he is having this battle. If you know anything about church history, you all know about Martin Luther, the great reformer. Martin Luther, in his, in his uh, in biography, or in his biography, reading history, Martin Luther would say that he would whip himself 39 times over the back because of sin that was in his life. And he thought that he had to beat it out of him. But realize that no matter how much he beat it out of him, it was still present with him everywhere he went. And that's why I call it Clash of the Titans. Because there's a fight against God's will and my will. You see, notice in our text this evening, we find our Savior, Savior, Earth's Emancipator, our Lord, Leader, and Liberator. is having the greatest ordeal of his life. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, pitching him on his, knee, on his knees as he kneels on the ground, agonizing in prayer. Sweat drops from his temples. Tears fall from his eyes as he calls out to his Father in prayer. He says, Father, if it's possible for you to let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but let yours be done. It's amazing that even Jesus Christ knows that he has to pray. Hmm. Even God on earth knows that he needs to go seek the Father. You see, make no mistake. 
Jesus didn't wait until things got bad before he began to pray. You read throughout the scripture, Jesus had a consistent prayer life. He was always in communion with God. If you do not have a consistent prayer life with the Father, it will never become a habit. You're just going to wait until the test is the next day before you get on your knees. You're going to wait until you are in a tight situation. That's when you get on your knees. No, the Bible says pray without ceasing. That means you must always continually be in communion with God. And so understand that Jesus was praying and asking the Father, Lord, if there's any way for you to save humanity, then please show me. Nevertheless, this is not about what I want, but it's all about what the Father wants. And so in a real sense, God said no. When he spoke to Jesus, he told him no. There's only one way to save humanity. And you know, it's always a difficult thing when we deal with God's no's. You know, every time we pray, God doesn't always say yes. We understand that, right? <laughs> How many times have you prayed for a family member to get better, and it seems like you would stay praying and praying and praying, and some way, somehow, they still have cancer? How many times I know that in my own life, being at Ephesus, let me tell you, we do funerals on average, about 50 funerals a year. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, when you get into church, you know that's a lot of funerals in a year. So most churches probably only do about two, because we have a lot of senior members. And there are many times when I go to the hospital, and me and my senior, my senior pastor and I, and we pray that God would deliver this person and heal them, and that God says no. How many times have you asked God for something? How many times have you desired something and God said no? You see, dealing with God's no is always a difficult thing. Because the Bible says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. Jesus said, if you ask for anything, ask it in my name and it shall be given unto you. But there are times when God says no. What do you do when God says no? How do you move on when God says no? How do you move on when God says, you know what, that's not for you? You see, whenever God gives you a no, there's always an instead. Hmm. When Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10, Paul said, I have this thorn in my flesh, and I prayed to God three times that he would take it away from me. And he realized that the Father was not going to take it away from him. Instead, God told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. You see, whenever God says no, there is always an instead. Whenever God says no, it's because he doesn't want you to have that. Instead, he wants you to have something else. When Moses, Moses, we all know about Moses, right? Moses struck the rock. God told him, no, you can't enter into the promised land. Instead, I'm going to have you caught up to be with me in heaven. You see... Every time when God says no, it's not simply because God doesn't want you to, to, uh, to, to God doesn't want to be this mean man that, that it looks above us and doesn't want to grant us certain things. It's that God understands that his will is sometimes no is the best answer that we need. And so instead, we got to trust God. Notice that Jesus was not wrestling with God's will or resisting God's will. He was yielding himself to God's will. Jesus knew what the will of the Father was, but was just hoping that maybe God would have had another way. Instead, the scriptures tells us that Jesus had to go to the cross. You see, the problem with us is that we make everything about us. Our prayers are even selfish. Everything we do is selfish. You know, sometimes the biggest enemy, not even sometimes, most times, the biggest enemy is the inner me. I'm the biggest enemy against God. I'm the biggest enemy against God's will. Because I come to church from Sabbath to Sabbath, and I listen to a preacher speak, and when the preacher makes me appeal, I say no. Devil doesn't force me to say no. Devil doesn't force me to sin. Devil doesn't put a bottle, uh, uh, devil may put a, a bottle of alcohol in front of me and put some marijuana joints in front of me, but yet and still I make the decision to do it. Devil may have told me to go over to his house or go over to her house or drive our car and park up in this place, but at the end of the day, I still say yes. And so the biggest enemy is the inner me. And that's what we fight with all the time because that is the clash 
of the Titans right there. You have got somebody against you because our will is to be famous. God's will is to be humble. Our will is to be served. God's will is to serve somebody. My will is to receive. God's will is to give to others. My will is to fight. God's will is to surrender. My will says that I am God. Do you ever notice that sometimes that we are doing the very same things that Lucifer was kicked out of heaven for? Wow. Wow. Chasing our own selfish ambitions. Chasing after our own goals. Tomorrow I'm going to break it down even more. There are always two types of people in this world. There's the one type of person that will make the world better for themselves, and the other type of people only make the world better for others. And so you got to ask yourself, in what realm do you fit into? What is your education and your purpose for? Are you simply getting degrees because you want to have a big house, a nice car, and all those things? But are you going to use your degree to help somebody who needs it? Because we are so self-absorbed. We worship ourselves. Ourselves are idols. And that's that flesh inside of us that's battling. And so as we go a little further, you see, we look at the sex, and then we see that after Jesus completes his prayer with the Father, he goes to check on Peter, James, and John, but only to find them asleep. Just the time he needed them the most to be praying for him, they are asleep. And truth be told, that's why I always say, you had better learn how to pray for yourself, because nine times out of ten, most people that you ask to pray for you probably ain't praying for you in the first place. I'm a living testimony. Many people ask me to pray for them. But I'm human. I can't remember to pray for everybody. That's why you got to have a relationship and a prayer relationship with the Father for yourself. Because sometimes people will forget. But there isn't nothing worse than to see in this text that the very people that you thought you can count on sleeping on you. Jesus was probably like, after all the stuff I done did for you, Peter, James, and John, after I brought you out, after all these things, you couldn't stay up just one hour. You couldn't sacrifice yourself for me. And we see this whole thing, this whole battle itself is going on. And so verse 41, Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not in temptation, or how one translation puts it, stay alert, be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without even knowing that you are in danger. These earthquakes in diverse places, tsunamis, all this thing, the earth, Jesus says, the very rock shall cry out if you don't give me praise. Well, I believe that the very earth is crying out, trying to tell God's people, trying to tell this world that Jesus Christ is coming soon, and we still worried about if we're going to get the next iPhone or the iPad. Dang. The earth is crying out. These things that science, science can't even, science can't even, even um, uh, 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 give an answer in regards to why these things are happening. They just say, oh, this is a cycle that happens every 50 or every 75 years. No, it's not a cycle. It is Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. And if we're not praying, because we, 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 we live in a world, in a state, or in a society where we think that the worst can't happen to us. Hmm. We just wake up and just think that, oh, we're going to go to class and go back, go back to sleep. You know, it's so funny how I always say it's like people put faith in so many other things, but they never put faith in God. For example, we all jump on an airplane. Never asked to see the pilot, never asked to see the pilot's license, never asked that we just buckle up, sit up in the airplane, and expect the airplane to take us to the next place. Matter of fact, we call taxis. Anybody ever been in a taxi before? You ever seen a taxi? Anybody, isn't there? You been in a taxi? Do you ask the taxi driver, can I see your license? No. Do you ask the 